Okay, ready? Yeah. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with our 10 o'clock session. Those of you still playing along at home, fairly alive. We're all making it. In good shape. Uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Tom Ferris and Tina Warburg, who will be talking to you. They come from Animal Ventures. Uh, and they'll explain kind of what that is. Uh, she'll also be doing our uh, keynote later on, uh, learning about the blockchain. So hopefully it'll blow your mind a little bit. Um, some mind-bending things, but just kind of get an understanding of what the technology is. But we're very excited uh, to have them both here, and so thank you, and I'm going to get right out of the way and let's get started. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Great. So we wanted to actually kind of deep dive today and give you a chance to ask us a lot of questions. We want it to be super interactive. We have a presentation prepared that um, should take you through some of the concepts of blockchain, uh, as well as you know, what we find really interesting about the technology, but ideally this is really for you. It's a time for you to be able to ask a lot of questions um, and hopefully get some good answers. Yeah, I would think of it just purely interactive. Uh, we basically took a day-long session and condensed it to an hour, so uh, you're going to have a lot of questions. <laughs> so I would definitely feel free to interrupt, raise your hand as you go along. <coughs> If we specifically address something, maybe later in the presentation, we might say, oh, we'll get to that. But you know, feel free to ask questions. Yeah. It's ideally just fodder for you guys to, to come up with some good questions for us. Um, um, so maybe our background, yeah. we'll tell you a little bit about ourselves. I'm a political scientist by training. I'm not a technologist. I uh, came into the blockchain space in late 2013. Um, most of, can you guys hear us OK? okay. Um, mostly because I was interested in governance. I think it is a technology that um, changes some of our fundamental constructs and legacy institutions, and we'll talk about that a little bit today. And so that's kind of what gave me the first bug, and I got really involved with um, a lot of the early entrepreneurs in the space out in Silicon Valley, and then expanded into a very global network. Um, and Tom and I teamed up and started doing a lot of um, projects with large Fortune 500s and governments to help them actually partner with developers in the space and come up with real use cases that they can actually implement. So we do a lot of almost project-based entrepreneurship today, and that's most of what our business is about. We focus on um, blockchain, but also on AI and IoT, which I'll be talking about a little bit later today uh, in my keynote, but that's my background. Uh, my background, I'm sort of a college dropout. I did the K-12, but I didn't go beyond that. Um, and uh, built a company called Rally uh, in college. Hightailed it out to Silicon Valley, raised a bunch of money, built the largest political fundraising platform in the United States. We moved billions of dollars online for politicians, nonprofits, universities, schools. Um, did that for about a decade. Uh, the last three years were kind of a wild ride. Uh, exited in, I don't know, 2014 or so. Uh, moved on to go do some other things. Went to a group called Boston Consulting Group, uh, where I did, um, led effectively their innovation practice, helping big companies, uh, CEOs, boards, partner with startups, entrepreneurs, and emerging technologies. Uh, so did that for a bit, realized they were a little bit too slow for me, a um, little too big. So Patina and I decided to start up our own firm, Animal Ventures, uh, which basically, as a company, we specialize in these things. So, um, Tina's going to kick it off with some signals. Yeah, so I, I, wanted, I like to ask people what they actually have heard about blockchain. So have any of you read an article that kind of caught your interest or seen something in the news or talked to a friend and heard something about blockchain? What have you heard? Yeah, so, uh, well, so Bitcoin is a good, that's kind of a signal of, that's the first implementation of blockchain. We'll talk about Bitcoin. Any other examples that you've heard or things people have told you about blockchain? Ready. Yeah.
For what? Sorry. For visa. For visa. Uh, like uh, cross-border visas. No visa company. Oh, visa the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So another sort of payment example. Currency Anything visa. else? Okay. How many of you have actually heard of blockchain? Besides before today. Kind of like lingering out in the in the atmosphere somewhere. You've heard it, but. May I ask a question? What have you guys heard about in general? So, is, any, is, somebody, is it just somebody mentioning something to you, or in passing, in the news? Yeah. Presentations online. Yeah. Mostly Bitcoin related. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Or. Okay. Health record. Health oh, record. Okay. Health record. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and anything in particular there that they would you know you'd have them be secure or that there's you could share them or <laughs> sharing them well because of the distributed ledger mm. and the ability to audit mm. right so you would know these numbers. Mm. Mm. So there's that you know you you have that chain of trust. So a little bit beyond Bitcoin, but probably doesn't sound like a whole lot beyond more broader Bitcoin knowledge. But that's a really good example of where blockchain can go long term, especially if you can extrapolate from health records. So we hear about kind of blockchain for everything, right? Like a lot of our world is people say, oh, well, you know, blockchain can solve my problem in land titles or in, um, you know, banking the unbanked or in saving the rainforest. And it's like, whoa, there's just a lot of, um, a lot of different examples. And we usually call these kinds of examples signals. Signals are kind of a, um, um, a word that a lot of people use who are researching sort of emerging technologies. And they're these sort of blips. There are little examples that you're seeing pop up in different places that kind of look weird. They might um, make you think, oh, that's, that's sort of a strange idea or that's not, you know, I haven't seen that before. Um, but when they start to accumulate, you start to get a bigger picture of what's happening and why people are talking about a specific technology in a certain way. So, you know, Bitcoin is a great example of a signal. It sort of popped up and only in about 2013 did I start to see people actually really talking about Bitcoin and then describing all these new ways of thinking about the same architecture. So it's, I like to talk about signals because we, we usually think of them against something like trends. Trends, you know, are obvious. There are things we know are going to happen or continue. For instance, um, trends in demographics and population. Those are things that we can monitor and measure and uh, see over time. Signals are before that. There's sort of this, you know, popcorn effect of things happening that don't totally make sense yet, but we know there's something going on there, right? Yeah, and you might think about it. You know, there's an enormous hype cycle around blockchain. That. And that, I think, leads into... Oh, yeah. It looks a lot like this. It looks like that. Like, if you actually started scouring newspapers and uh, the web and social media for stuff about blockchain, you're going to see a lot of announcements about, oh, you know, a new startup or some new partnership with a bank or a new um, coalition being formed <coughs> that's maybe a little secretive and they're not saying what they're doing with blockchain yet. And it's, it's very much um, it's mostly noise. a noisy, yeah, a noisy world. And there's a reason for that. It's because we're in this sort of signals phase. We don't totally know where the technology is going to be most applicable or where it's going to lead us in terms of um, you know, concrete use cases and development. We're in this kind of popcorn-y experimental phase. So I would like to kind of preface um, blockchain with that because people go really far. It's easy to go down the rabbit hole and it's such an exciting technology and there's good reason to do that. But we also want to take a step back and say, it's new and there's lots of ways to experiment with it, but it's certainly not, you know, it's not in the ready to be implemented in some large scale example yet. And it's certainly not going to solve all of the problems. 
no, it's not going to solve everything. So um, I wanted to give you guys just like a little intro to blockchain and then hopefully you guys will have questions. Um, we have some further uh, parts about the economics and the business that we'll get into too, but I wanted to start with kind of the high level on the tech side. So um, these are sort of three ways I like to talk about blockchain. The first is just historical. When did this come about, right, this term? And really the flag got planted in 2008 when we saw the, the publication of the first white paper that described Bitcoin as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Um, so that got published online. It was published by this individual or many individuals called Satoshi Nakamoto, which are kind of mysterious. But um, that was really the flag being planted. It got built out in 2009 and has been up and running ever since. So if we think about sort of historically, people were working on a lot of the technologies relevant to blockchain, cryptography, distributed systems architecture, all of these things you know, are fields of their own and um, are constantly evolving, but they really came together to form this idea of blockchain in 2008. So that's sort of the history. Uh, and if we think about the concepts behind it, what we usually talk about and um, authors like Don Tapscott talk about is this move from an idea of an internet of information, which is what we have today, to an internet of value. And by that I mean in a blockchain we can actually create unique digital assets and then transfer them uh, in this same kind of interconnected way that we today transfer just information. So our, our internet today is kind of a copy-paste internet. The information goes on there and it just, you know, it can be spread anywhere. You can't revoke it. It's not particularly well suited to do anything than this sort of messaging architecture that it was built on. But blockchain is a very different architecture. It allows this transfer of unique assets um, and the custodianship over time of those assets. So you're thinking about being able to transfer something of value um, in the same, same uh, scale. And then the last point is technically, and I'm going to go into this, this definition um, a bit more now, which is we usually talk about blockchains as a decentralized database that stores a registry of transactions across a peer-to-peer -peer network. That's kind of a mouthful, so um, I'm going to break down what that definition really can mean. Um, and first I want to go to this idea of a block because people get kind of hung up on the, on the nomenclature. Why is it called blockchain, right? Um, when we're talking about a block, we're really talking about a lump of transactions over time that get cryptographically uh, combined into a block of data. Um, the real world analogy that uh, one of our friends who's one of the inventors of the Ethereum network likes to give is that of a checkbook. If you look at a check, it's, you know, it's a contract actually, it's sort of an IOU transaction, it has your signature, right? And then over time in your checkbook, you have all those little carbon copies that are sort of all stacked together in one, um, one sort of chunk. And that you can think of as a block of data. It's a set of transactions over time um, that are linked together, right? So that's sort of, if you had to picture something, there's really no visuals in the blockchain world. It's something you have to kind of push yourself to imagine. We're talking about a set of transactions, um, you know, that are signed and unique and that they're lumped together over time. So that's sort of a block of data. Then we get to this idea, well, it's a registry of transactions. What does that mean? We're linking all of these blocks of data to one another cryptographically over time. It's like a really long ledger. It's a long list of all of the transactions that have happened in a network. And so you can start to think, okay, well, I, you know, if we go back to the checkbook, it's almost, now I have all of my checkbooks over time, you know, numerically ordered. And they live in a little shoebox, right? That's that's the blockchain, this is a really small example. Um, and so this, this registry, part of what it does is you have to think about, it's not storing all of your data. It's storing, um, think about the carbon copy. It's storing the fact that some transaction happened and how to point to that transaction, right? It's, it's more like a little directory or a phone book. It's not storing all this 
um, personal information about you. That's not really what the blockchain is a good tool for. And then this last point is it's peer-to-peer, -peer, right, in the definition I gave. So that means we can imagine this shoebox that Tom has the same shoebox I do, and you all have the exact same shoebox as well. So we're all actually um, holding this same record, this same ledger of transactions is uh, decentralized. It lives on every single node um, participating in a blockchain network. Uh, that's part of what makes it really interesting, um, which we'll get into in a bit, but it's, uh, it's also a useful way to think about one of the traits of blockchains being not having a central administrator, right? We, we usually have a central administrator for a database. And this is an architecture that says, no, instead of having one single point of failure, we're actually going to make sure that every single one of us participating in the network is also securing that network and uh, has a, a valid copy of the same data. So that's the sort of high level um, technical version. And then I like to complement it with a more meaningful definition. And when we talk about tech, usually meaning comes from affordances. What does this technology do differently than a central system I already have, right? And these are the traits that, there are many traits. These are four of the traits that we think are particularly relevant um, when we talk about affordances of this technology. The first is it's permissionless. And um, I will preface it by saying this is for public blockchains. We can get into other kinds of blockchains too. But for public blockchains, it's permissionless. The Bitcoin network, you can use it right now. You can download a full node. You can be a you know, validator in the system. You can do all of those things. You can read and you can write to it. It is a permissionless system. Um, the second trait is it's transparent. Whatever goes in there is accessible to everybody else. So it's not a tool to store a bunch of data, um, but it means that you can actually see what happens over time, which is a really amazing trait. Um, the third trait is immutability, which you mentioned as well. Uh, because we're storing um, this system using cryptography and sort of linking these blocks to one another, you're actually creating sort of a more permanent history over time which makes it very hard to go back and alter anything at the very beginning. You'd have to alter it on every single one of our uh, nodes, which is just extremely complicated to do. So the immutability factor is saying this is permanent. What's on there is permanent. We can trust that it's there um, you know, forever, essentially. And then the last trait is security. And you can talk about, you mentioned that, you can talk about that in different ways. One is you know, we're using advanced cryptography to um, use this system. But another form of security is, is the way that it is constructed, the architecture of being this uh, decentralized database. You'd have to get so many of, you know, over 50% of the nodes to cooperate or coordinate um, or be hacked in order to manipulate the system. And that's much harder than one central point of failure for a central administrator. So these are some of the traits that, you know, there's not all of them. There's other ones as well. You can go into things about anonymity and those kinds of things. But this is really the set of traits we find most interesting that other technologies don't really accomplish today. I'm going to turn it over to Tom for a second. And then we'll chat more. Any questions right now on just the sort of high level on blockchain? Um, so blockchain and value creation. Now, the, we talk a lot about that. What does this mean? It's an internet of value. If you think about kind of what we're dealing with here, there's many layers to blockchain. Today you're hearing about the Bitcoin core network, you're hearing about the Ethereum network. This is really just core infrastructure. This is no different than say TCP IP or SMTP. It's just a protocol on how you go about, you know, creating unique digital things, right? On top of that, you'll have an API and you'll have a middleware layer. And this is, again, not a whole lot different than, say, the, the Internet today. You're going to have things like Hadoop and so on that make it 
much more easy to build on top of the core protocol technology. And value creation is going to happen at each level, right? At the very high level, you're going to have the application layer. That's Facebook, Pinterest, iPhone apps, and so on. These are apps that are built on top of middleware, which are built on top of core protocol technologies, right? If you think about blockchain, it's actually not a whole lot different. In fact, there are many core infrastructures being built today. You've probably heard of a lot of different blockchain networks. It's just that Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two biggest. I think Ethereum just literally passed 10 billion in value today. Uh, Bitcoin, I think, is 20 billion, maybe even more now. It's, it's continuing to increase. But there's not a whole lot of middleware companies that's still kind of being figured out. There's a lot of core protocol technology out there right now. Kind um, of, we like to describe it almost as 1990s internet. You know, we're, we're in early days. This, this is there's really a lot of early. flurry of hype and excitement, but the reality is there's still a huge amount being um, built at the core level, and then there's just some experiments kind of above it. But there's, there's a lot. There's a lot happening do. at the application layer when it comes to Bitcoin, right? And there are billions of dollars got invested into Bitcoin from Silicon Valley. Most of that money was entirely lost, right? And that's because a lot of the core protocol technology is still evolving quite quickly, right? And we'll learn a little bit more about that today. Um, so beyond that, we're going to get into what we call the basics of blockchain. Bettina and I actually produce an online course on Udemy uh, that you can go and watch. It's about an hour and a half long. Uh, but it's called the basics of blockchain. And we get into the economics, the business, and the technology behind blockchain itself. Uh, so as I was sort of mentioning earlier, if you think back to this image here, the sort of core infrastructure, the middleware, and the application layer, Blockchain, you know, over here it sounds like this really weird, nebulous, confusing thing. At the end of the day, the tactics, right, the technologies themselves, blockchain and the middleware and all that, they might change, but ultimately the principles of how this all works is still the same. Right? You guys are probably not going to be building blockchains. You're not going to be doing core protocol development. You're probably not even going to be doing middleware development. You're probably going to be operating in the application layer. Right. Or you're going to be buying application layer technology uh, when you think about your vendors and things like that. Right? So it's just something to keep in mind as you try to demystify this technology and realize it's not a whole lot different than what you're already dealing with today. Uh, so to best understand blockchain, uh, we believe that it's super important to really think about the economics behind it first because that's going to help you understand the why factor of why it exists, the technology is going to evolve and change dramatically. It's, it's science. It's going to evolve. It already has evolved rapidly, right? And it's going to continue to accelerate in terms of change on the innovation front. Um, the business opportunities, I mean, you, you can come up with billions of ideas, legitimately, uh, especially once you understand the economic story behind the technology itself. So Bettina is going to uh, dive deep into the economics for a bit. So this is, you guys get kind of a preview to what I'm going to talk about this afternoon too, but um, when we talk about the economics of blockchain, I actually like to go really way, way far back um, and think about our early agrarian days. When we did trade, we did this in a one-to-one -one way, right? We were in a small community, and if things went wrong, we just you know, it was social repercussions. You got exiled, you got, you know, you, there was violence. There were very real, concrete ways to deal with um, reneging on business deals. And over time, though, um, you know, our trade grew much more <coughs> complex. Our societies grew. We had not this direct relationship anymore about the kinds of business deals we were going through. And our distance of trade grew. You know, we were starting to trade with groups very far away and had no direct control. And in that case, we ended up inventing things called institutions. There's a whole brand of uh, economics called new institutional economics, which sort of takes this idea. We invented these institutions, things like banks and um, certain forms of government, and mercantile organizations to really, and marketplaces, to be the uh, middlemen, to help grease the wheels on our trade and make sure that things went um, the way we wanted to. They lowered our uncertainties about our business dealings. 
And then eventually, we basically put these same institutions online when we entered the digital age. We have Amazon, we have eBay, we have you know, new apps like Airbnb and all these things. They're basically just tools that allow us to lower our uncertainty about one another uh, so that we can do business at greater and greater scale. So if this is, this is what we think of as our economics, we've sort of grown institutions of different kinds over time to help us adapt to the scale of trade and the scale of business that we want to do. Um, and their, their whole purpose is lowering our uncertainty about one another so that we're willing to do trade. The question is, what's next, right? If that was sort of the architecture from the past. And what we call what's next is decentralized institutions. And what's very cool about decentralized institutions is they actually kind of look like the beginning. They look a lot more like those agrarian days. We can have a one-to-one -one kind of exchange of value, but do it at the scale we're accustomed to uh, with the digital age. And so it's almost like instead of these formal institutions that we've built up to accomplish that, we can actually now rely on technology to play that role in a lot of circumstances. So this is sort of where, we're, where we've gone, right? We've, we went from this one-to-one, -one, we had some intermediaries, and now we're going back almost to this um, idea of being able to be one-to-one -one at scale with a lot less intermediaries. And that's where blockchain comes in. So a lot of, I mean, it's really high level to think about that kind of economics, but it's actually kind of helpful because this, this is what this technology accomplishes for us. You know, if, if we're doing, <coughs> Um, if we're using a technology as a tool for transfer of value, then it's helpful to actually think about what's changed in how we transfer value over time. And if we can accomplish a lot of those same things, the scale of trade with lowered uncertainty through a technology um, that gives us visibility and a lot of these additional uh, benefits, then we may actually change the role of these traditional institutions, like banks and marketplaces, um, you name it. So that's actually also why a lot of what you'll hear are, you know, these big companies kind of trying to band together to learn a lot about blockchain because they're pretty nervous right now that this is a technology that is going to cut them out of the middle. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about the technology and then uh, some of the business. But I think I just want to reiterate this point. I mean, the story that Bettina was telling the story of trade that's been going on for a super long time, right? I mean, if you sit back and you think about, you're, you're thinking about blockchain as crazy technology, it's just, a, it's just a continuation of the story that Bettina told. You're just using technology to expand on that story. So it's, it's really not a whole lot different than what we're doing today, right? So it goes back to this idea that the tactics themselves might change, the tools by which how we trade might change, um, but the principles of trade, they remain the same, right? <clears throat> so we're going to get into the technology, move beyond the economics. Um, the technology, as Bettina mentioned, was first introduced in 2008. Uh, this number is old, but over the span of about eight years, Bitcoin went from being this kind of thing that was invented with zero value to, I, I'm pretty sure today it's over $20 billion. I haven't checked the numbers, but Bitcoin is now like $1,600 per Bitcoin at this point. Uh, and that's pretty high. Uh, and in fact, if anything, a lot of people think it's going to continue to go up. Uh, so this thing was manufactured and rose to 20 billion in value over the span of about eight years. PayPal, the company, has a market valuation of 20 billion dollars. This technology is as big as PayPal. Just put that in perspective for a little bit, right? Ethereum. We started doing this presentation earlier this year, and at 18 months, Ethereum was worth 1.1 billion dollars at the beginning of this year. Today, literally today, it's now over $10 billion. Airbnb is worth $10 billion. If you, I mean, just having a billion in value over 18 months is an extraordinary growth. $10 billion 
in less than 24 months is ridiculous, right? So Ethereum is just to... Um, we'll, and we'll get into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't want to confuse it. First, I just want to paint the landscape for you, a little bit of the picture, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the technology, right? So Bitcoin, as Patina mentioned, was the first application of blockchain technology. Ethereum, you can think of as the evolution of Bitcoin. And what they figured out was, oh, I can use this same technology and I can insert rules into it. I can insert if this, then that statements. It's not just a, a record of a transaction in the ledger and the history of it anymore. I can actually uh, put little uh, snippets of code into it and program it. And that was a massive evolution of the technology itself, right? So <clears throat> I want to kind of dumb it down for you a little bit to think about what that ultimately means. So a lot of people sort of think of this technology of, of blockchain as a massive, global, decentralized virtual machine, okay? Basically a giant global virtual computer. And what can you do with any computer? You can build apps on it, okay? Well, well there's one big network and I have to sort of manage my access and usage of that network, the resources, the computing power of that network, right? So. If you're familiar with your own activity monitor on your computer, or you can pull it up and see, okay, you know, what is this app using? What percentage of the CPU is it using, right? Your computer is this sort of central authority that's saying, okay, Chrome browser is now open. Send all the resources over to allow Chrome so that you can surf the web, basically. That's, again, very dumbed down version of what's going on. Well, as the Ethereum network has grown, and you have many, many, many nodes, the computing power of that network has grown as well, too. And more and more people are starting to build apps on that, right? So how do you manage the resources of this growing network? Well, you have something called Ether, and that's what's at 10 billion in value, right? So the more people that want to write apps to use the computing power of the network, you obviously are going to have a problem where you're going to have a finite amount of resources that those apps are going to compete over in order to run transactions on that network, right? So how do you manage that sort of finite supply? Yeah, it's growing over time, but still, in the moment, it's, it's somewhat finite, right? So Ether tokens are essentially issued and they're kind of, this is where you kind of get into the debate of is it a security or is it function? I don't quite understand. But Ether is essentially issued uh, to, you can buy it, obviously, but when you use the app, that app has to spend Ether to run a transaction on that network. Sometimes it's called gas. It's literally the fuel of the network. But it's the rules. It's how you manage the resources of the network. So as many, 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 many people start using the network and as many apps start using the network, it manages the resources of the network. And so as more people want to use it, there's a finite amount of ether available. What's going to happen to the value of that ether? It's obviously going to rise because more people want to use the network. And thus, if you hold ether, you have also value creation in that manner, right? And so you can think of it uh, in that manner. That's, to me, kind of the best way to think about it. What happens is these base guys basically built a giant global virtual computer that literally is entirely decentralized. There's no central authority managing it, and anybody can build an app on it. So that's pretty dang cool. And if it's increasing in value, then that means a lot of people really want to use it. Right? From 1 billion to 10 billion? In literally month, like in the last two months, right? That's crazy. Uh, so again, what you're dealing with is sort of the core infrastructure. That's the core protocol, Ethereum. Middleware, where that still has a lot of innovation needs right now. Uh, most of the people building on it, they're still building the libraries by which you would access the different protocols and things like that. And then you have the application layer, right? Uh, so there's a lot of evolution still happening. 
Uh, and with that, you know, we have to keep in mind that blockchains are still, like while Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two predominant networks out there, there's many more coming. There's Zcash, right, which is less than three months old, but also getting a lot of adoption. That one really is back more in the currency bucket, and that one really is about more, hey, uh, getting us back to the idea that uh, digital currency is anonymous, right? Cash is effectively anonymous, and so they're trying to create the digital equivalent of that, right? Uh, Polkadot, which is um, sort of thinking about the world as an internet of blockchains, but they don't really kind of connect to each other and they can't really c communicate right now. So Polkadot is this idea that, well, we can be sort of this master relay chain, this um, settlement layer of data, effectively, where we have all these different blockchains, so they can send data to Polkadot, and Polkadot can then make that data accessible by other blockchains. So then that, all these different blockchains communicate with each other. And then Definity, which is uh, relatively new as well, too, but growing quite fast, um, is more about building sort of a, like a nervous system, a, a computational nervous system. Uh, with core business, like, you know, ride sharing as a protocol. No longer Uber, gone. Ride sharing as a protocol. It's taking the Uber concept and making it a business protocol that anyone can leverage and anyone can build a smart contract on top of. Um, so that's neat. So just to go, go back one. Hmm? So just to look at this, you know, you've probably heard the most about Bitcoin, right? Um, and it's the longest in existence. But that was really um, built and geared towards this idea of peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. So what we're saying is with the development of Ethereum, you got this almost general purpose blockchain that evolved. So it's not just about financial transactions. It's saying, can't we track or transact anything of value? Yes, we can. It doesn't have to be this thing called Bitcoin that functions as a digital currency. It could be something else. And so when Ethereum was developed, it was the first version of saying, we can create a more generalizable form of this architecture called blockchain. And instead of just <coughs> transferring Bitcoin back and forth through accounts, we're going to use this architecture and write code that um, executes on this network, this decentralized network. So that's the main sort of jump. And then these are all variations. And what we're starting to see, it's really this is sort of the point about it being a science and that it is evolving. Uh, and that we're seeing some of these affordances be uh, more specialized. You know, Zcash is trying to push towards the anonymity side, which I didn't talk too much about, but they're each sort of pushing at different elements of what this technology can do well. So before we move forward, I mean, we've, we've definitely talked about what the tech stack might look like. And if you're thinking about the future, where are you going to play as an institution and as an organization? Um, I want to see if there's any questions before we... Yes. My overall difficulty in this is it's... Has anything been devalued yet? Yes. Because it, the idea is that whether it, you know, which, it doesn't matter which vendor, if the value keeps increasing, it'll just become prohibitively expensive to ever even use. So there's a disincentive to use it at all unless you're on the ground floor. And that's that's the problem the concept. Like, the so concept the is great, you know, like yeah. healthcare transactions and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes sense. But the the value of it that you're talking about, it's, it's just like Bitcoin. There's no way I will ever have a Bitcoin. Like I, I sure, but you it, can but buy point oh 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 one Bitcoin. But is, you, you can but is, you can fractionalize it in ways that no, I, I are I not that. possible and, today. And, and I get that, but is but I'm not sure what the incentive is because. So the 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 value of the Bitcoin, the reason a lot of people value the, the currency is a byproduct of creating an extremely long history. Right. What they really care about is knowing that um, I can span now eight years of transactional history. It's immutable. It's not, nobody's, nobody's changed the data because that's an extremely difficult thing to do. 
basically have to predict the next block, which means you have to control 51% of the network or Has over 50%. Happened Hasn't happened, no. I thought, I Definitely thought, not I happened. I thought someone had fired up like 51% nodes. No, never happened. I mean, that would be the computational power that would require would be so massive and so enormous and so massively expensive. And that's the whole concept. It's the game theory behind the network. Nobody's actually done that because the literally, in order to do that, you have to mine Bitcoin. And to do that, that costs energy. So, I mean, multiple billions of dollars would, it would cost to do that for one block. But to get to your question, I think um, Bitcoin is one you know, right, it's one. one. Thing. Well, but, but see, like e even with Ethereum, get, like right. okay, so I'm. It's like, oh hey, I, yeah. I'd like to use a blockchain. Yeah. But even the more that I use within my own company, it's going to cost me more money. So here. Because it's it's like I have no economy of scale. It's right. like I want 200 units. Do I get a discount? Right. So you this is where more. private chains <laughs> play a role as well, which is basically people are starting to develop. It's almost like the intranet, right? People are developing their own blockchains that would be. Okay for a specific company, for a specific industry, for et cetera, et cetera. But where it's also, the, the value is relative though, right? So it doesn't cost much for your app to do something on the network. The, 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 the cost of the transaction on the network is like 0.000035 ether. Like it's, it's super cheap to actually have your app do something. Right, so what when you buy one ether, yeah, it's at 100, and yeah, it's fluctuating value, but the marginal cost is actually quite low for your app to do that. So yes, while there, you can do private chains and things like that, that's not really the answer to what you're asking. You know, you will also own ether that will, as more people get onto it, increase in value over time as well too. Right, so. The, the question here is, um, you know, when you really think about the value component of it, the, 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 the opportunity really rests at your ability to do something that you weren't able to do before, which is you can break it into point oh 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 three five. It's not possible today, right? And that's a huge difference, huge difference. If, it, if I want to pay you money, Right, if, I, if I PayPal you money, it actually costs PayPal about 50 cents to do that. Right? To go up to the ACH network, to come down from the ACH network, it's a 50 cent transaction, which is why micropayments don't exist. I can't, I can't. why Apple lumps all of your purchases and does it once? On a weekly basis. Right, so our core infrastructure as a world and global economy is sitting on this massively old, expensive architecture. You, know, you can't have streaming music where I can I can pay for 45 seconds, you know, because I'm paying 0001. You know, it's just not possible today. Um, so if you think about where that goes, and then your ability to tr sort of fractionalize things, um, I think that's a better way to look at it because you're not going to go out there to try to buy. You know, the the purpose of Ethereum is not a currency, right? right? But but at the same time, you said that I, I actually hold Ethereum. Yeah, but people are going to buy your app, right? And you've got to think about it as an economy. So if, I, if, I'm in a, if I'm a smart contract, and we can kind of get into this a little bit later on the business side of it, but if I'm a smart contract, and that contract is about me and you using this autonomous vehicle over here, and I'm the creator of this smart contract, which is the application layer, right? And we'll talk a little bit about the application layer. But you're going to charge a fee for the usage of that smart contract. So my fee is 0 0.0002 Ether, and the gas to execute that smart contract on the Ethereum network is 0 0.001. So you have, a, you, have a, you have a contribution margin, positive transaction, right? And so. While yes, it costs that app to execute that transaction, you're also making money on that transaction at the exact same time, right? At the simultaneously. And so while you don't necessarily, you know, you're not going to go out and try. You might 
buy some ether, but you don't need a ton of it if you have a smart contract that's actually out there generating revenue for you. So when we decide to hop in on that autonomous vehicle, right, that you own, or either you wrote the smart contract, somebody else owns the autonomous vehicle maybe, and there's some governance layers in there, right? When I actually hop in, I'm effectively signing a contract with you and executing at the exact same time. You're making your money as a smart contract developer. It's all getting executed and transacted on the network. And then maybe there's a profit distribution to the autonomous car owner. Right? So that's a little bit more on the business side. Does that help? A, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. But it's also still early days. So I think yeah. we're going to see different networks come up with also different uh, financing components to how they incentivize the growth of their network as well. So it's doable. Yeah. I heard about it early adopters that did go to Bitcoin and so they spent they found a pizza place and paid two hundred Bitcoin for pizza. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I lost my yeah. early Bitcoin. I just I lost my wallet. I totally gone. You know. That happens a lot and a lot of early people sure. lost a lot of Bitcoin before it was more yeah. valuable. My question for you then is the one blockchain and this is we're in the weeds right now. Yeah, it's sure, definitely the weeds. Yeah. Yes. These days with 3D printing, big thing. People create uh, an SQL file or something that they can set up. Once somebody has it, it's easy to transfer that entire thing. It's so simple these days. But could it theoretically be put built into that that system with that architecture somehow such that they use it to get a one-time use and it expires? Yeah. I mean, that's the exact benefit of the technology, right? You can, and we can, when we get into the sort of business of blockchain, we talk about this idea as a song as its own business. Um, but yeah. But yeah, you could substitute any kind of Anything. creative content or intellectual property for that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, in the music space in particular, Imogen Heap released her album on um, on the blockchain and basically managed her own rights. So you you were using a smart contract to pay for her album and she didn't. And then you can download her album from after paying it. She didn't do it through uh, a record company. So she, Imogen Heap. Um, you know, there are definitely groups looking at it for royalties and for, I mean, the whole micropayments concept. Micropayments is but the killer app. But anything that you can certify, sure. you know, that it's yours and you're basically notarizing it by publishing it to the blockchain. It, it is provable that, you know, you put it there, et cetera. There's a lot of infrastructure that has to be built. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to change This is the app human, layer. human yeah. um, you know, bad behavior, necessarily. But that's, that's still true today, right? You can go pirate a video forever and try to... Totally. Right. Yeah, there's a, I mean, MIT's doing a lot of research on this stuff. Yeah. Harvard's doing a lot of research on this. I mean, there are enormous uh, opportunities in the sort of royalty and governance of digital content, yeah. right? Because that's, that's really what you're addressing. It, before it was too era. expensive it's to do this. Totally new space to think about how do you take digital assets and create economies on top of those where, yeah, it's kind of beyond digital rights management, you're saying, well, I can actually, you know, encode this in a certain way, plus have a payments architecture associated with it, plus have, you know, distribution or whatever else. Um, so there's, yeah, it's still early, but that's a totally valid um, line of thinking. Yeah, digital rights management is kind of big. We're doing a. <laughs> we're actually doing a lot of work on that right yeah, now. So the, I think that would help to maybe. I'm, I'm having, I think I got the financial part, but I'm having trouble understanding the other piece, how that wraps into the application. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, we'll back up and just say, so with that actual data, that would live where it would live today, right? Your doctor's notes will live in the same place they already do. What we would do with the blockchain architecture is essentially be able to create um, certification of those uh, documents existing, wherever they exist, in his, you know, your health portal or whatever, um, and have, you know, basically signed, you know, your doctor's going to sign, yeah, this, you know, I saw you today and these are my notes and, and that sort of hash is going to live on the blockchain. So it's, it's the pointers to the... It's security infrastructure around it, not the note itself. Right. You're not going to put that note on the blockchain. No way. But you're going to... Not today, not for sure. Not today, and anyway, the volume of that would just be massive. You're, I mean, it's more, it's really this, this phone book system where you can point to it and, um, and because it's been hashed, you can essentially know if it gets altered. It won't compute the same way. So it's not just saying this is where this document lives. It's saying this is where this document lives and it should look like, if, if it doesn't compute correctly, it's not the same document anymore, right? So there is- You're not, you're not pointing to a hyperlink, you're pointing to the context. Um, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're pointing to the context, right? And so what she was saying is you have this hash essentially that says this is the context of this, of this thing. And if those numbers don't match up, it's not the same thing. You, you, yeah, you could, you could set an alert, hey, those two don't match. Yeah. So then on the electronic medical records front, you're saying, okay, you know, we could go down a massive rabbit hole on the identity question, but you know, people are already working on creating tools for um, lumping, basically having smart contracts that you manage as an individual, which is almost like you can imagine a personal black box. It's like, this is my stuff. This is my alma mater that's been certified, and it lives in my little smart contract. This is all, you know, this is my health records, these are whatever. And then you can create permissions around them. Oh, yeah, I allow this doctor to sign, you know, as things get added. And I'm giving that, that individual or that identity permission in uh, writing to, um, you know, my, my system. So people are already building the identity architecture. It's a definite question around adoption. That's not clear at all. And this is like super early. But you can start to imagine all of these things about you that you might want certified. And instead of having to go hunt for that, you know, uh, for your electronic medical record or whatever, you can, you can just point somebody to it and then grant them access to it. So you're not entering that information over and over and over and over again. And you're also not, um, you have the control to be able to agree to who is accessing it. Yeah, I mean, you think about your own security systems, like username and password. That's a Band-Aid, actually, to a broken system. How do I really know, legitimately know, that that person that put in that username and password is that person? I mean, when I give Bettina my net Netflix username and password and she logs in, Netflix thinks it's me. It's not. Right? Maybe they're like matching up some IP. Yeah, we're sort of, we think it's you, but it's not, we, we don't know for a fact it's you. And how do I know, in your doctor's example, how do I know that that psychologist actually signed off on that? How do I know they're actually a psychologist? How do I know they have a degree in psychology? And how can I prove that in a portable way, instantaneously? That's, that's the key. Yeah. So the relationship between Ether and blockchain. So take another non like voting. Yep. What does Ether have anything to do in a voting context or is that only in a financial It can. Context? Ether is really is the uh, gas that powers the Ethereum network and you pay for it, which is why people think of it as kind of a digital currency, but that's not a function. Function is, um, you know, 
to Tom's point, like how you do resource management on this network, part of it is they, never, they didn't want people spamming the network with some infinite loop, right? It sucks up all the power and nobody else can do anything on this network. So they make you pay for it. They make you pay to use it. And that means, at least from sort of an economic incentive point of view, somebody's not going to pay infinitely to keep running their contract, right? So it's, uh, it's really just a, a tool within the Ethereum network. And so from the perspective of potentially doing something with voting, you could you know, create some kind of voting app or some you know, set of smart contracts that describe a voting system. And then you would be using, if you built it on the Ethereum network and their protocols, you would be using Ether to execute any of those contracts. So it's, and we haven't totally talked about smart contracts yet, but um, we can do that as well. Which is, but it's essentially just any kind of if this, then that statement with conditionality that you're writing as code that a computer can read and trigger. And in fact, internet voting is a potential use case of the technology itself. Once you link it to identity, where you could basically say, yeah, I can verify that this, that an individual you know, is legitimately is who they are. They yeah. claim they are, even if I don't know who they are, you know, specifically. I can tell that they have a valid ID, et cetera, and now they're voting this way. Um, so, here's my solution. Uh, public blockchain. Yep. At what point does it become so large that somebody knows? So we've got no drought and no replicating each other's blockchain. Yep. And this is a problem they're exploring now that they haven't quite solved. There's some people that have effectively, you know, um, they're, they're trying to create things like light clients and stuff to just make it so that you don't have to download the whole blockchain in order to, to sort have of verify. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's currently a problem. I mean, it already is a problem. Imagine trying to download the, the Bitcoin blockchain onto your iPhone. It, pro it takes up a lot of a lot of storage. So some um, people, yeah, some people are doing light light clients where you're you're referencing a full node, you're not acting as a full node, or where you're using you know um, just the most relevant uh, current state data about a blockchain in mm -hmm. order to you know do your transaction if that's an okay risk model for you. Um, so there's there's that, and then there's just it's literally a science. People are trying to think about how to manage the computing power in really different ways. Like some of the, you know, the current architecture, part of what makes it safer than a, you know, an internet or anything else is that, is that replication, right? But it's obviously also an inefficiency. You're not creating a network effect of, you're all doing the exact same work over again, right? You're not actually, incre every increased node also increases the work. So you're not getting the same kind of, you get other kinds of network effects, but you're not getting the same kind of network effect from that growth. You're just getting more volume. And so there are definitely people working on architectures that uh, do leverage the decentralization, but maybe randomize it in a different way. Because not everybody's doing the exact same thing. So sort of the, if you think about it as a science, you're starting to say, well, you know, Bitcoin was the first version of this. And then people tinkered around and said, well, I can, swap in, you know, writing code in this network instead of just transacting, um, you know, in financial concepts. And then now we're seeing, okay, well, these two systems use proof of work as their consensus mechanism, how all these nodes come to agreement on the state of the network. People are starting to say, well, do we have to use proof of work, which is where we each do all this individual effort? Could we use a different mechanism to come to agreement? about what the status of the network is. And there are different versions. There's uh, proof of stake, there's proof of authority, there's you know, people coming up with threshold relay concepts that basically randomize it in different ways or that you're putting up a certain amount of stake in order to be the validator, one of the validators of the network. So there's a lot of new, uh, it's really a science. And so each and of these parts of what makes a blockchain a blockchain and what makes it interesting are being tinkered with 
and designed in sort of new ways as well. And I, I would also just, one of the things Bettina will talk about in her keynote, this is why we don't just focus on blockchain. That's one really cool innovation that's happening. We spend a lot of time on AI and connected devices and things like that. But what you have is a convergence of a lot of things going on. Infinitely free storage. I mean, it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to store things. You can now store things forever. So as that changes and as your devices and their processing power and, you know, eventually it's not going to be a problem. Right? So there's, there's also that, how much innovation do you do now to solve that problem? Or do you just literally wait <laughs> 18 months, five years, whatever, for the latest evolution, and then that problem is entirely solved without having to worry about it? So a it's a lot of trade-offs. We have clients, too, where it's like, oh, a ginormous bank, and they say, why don't I just wait until the Oracle blockchain exists? and I'll just pay them a billion dollars and implement it when it's ready, right? Yeah, that's one way to do it. You can wait and see everything evolve and then, you know, make your cautious choice. But the other side of it is you don't need to be some implementer in, you know, you don't need to bet everything on the latest version of blockchain and you can still learn along the way. And actually that's a lot of what we advocate is, you know, this is, imagine being on the forefront of the internet when that was really coming about in sort of an enterprise way, right? Like that's, you learn a lot by being in step with where the technology is evolving and how it's evolving and what kind of use cases are working out and which ones clearly aren't, they're not the right fit, right? I mean, this is the technology that's looking for lots of product market fits right now. And so a lot of what we advocate is, yeah, it's kind of early and there's way, there's a lot of problems. There's a lot of tensions about you know, how do you solve some of those problems secure, securely? Um, but it's worth paying attention to it now because it's going to continue to evolve and continue to exist. And it might not be Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever is next that you're going to be using yourself. But if you're starting to understand what it does, you're, you're ahead of the game. So we've got about 13 minutes left. I'm going to power through the business and we'll answer some more questions. Um, so we like to talk about value creation in a decentralized economy. We, we talked a, a lot about these use cases already. Um, you know, collaborative insurance, fractional asset ownership. Um, this is where, these are places that value is going to be created in this future economy. You know, one of the things we like to talk about, uh, just in terms of, what, you know, we'll take education as an example. What should the students of today be learning to be prepared for tomorrow. For example, if you're going to law school today and the world is about coding smart contracts, which we'll get into a little bit more, um, maybe you should actually go from law to computer science or double major or something. Because, yeah, I you're still. Like this <laughs> yeah. Just, like, just became a lawyer. You really need to learn. You to code. need to learn how to code. You're going to have to because that you're going to have lawyer coders. Like that's probably going to be a new profession. Um, you know, there's KYC. We've kind of talked a little bit about that. The, the the massive, massive, massive global identity problem that exists in the world today. Know your customer. It's right. usually like know your customer anti-money laundering. Right. And KYC is a factor of a, a crappy identity system. Right. It's a, it's, it's a broken internet. Right. So the fact that we don't have true identities online. Yeah. We, we, in, when I say true idea, you don't need to know my name. You don't even know how old I I just need to know that that is legitimately you. Right. That doesn't exist and that's a problem. And it creates massive systemic problems. Right. Even your, you know, school documents and attendance records, and that's all of like a, an attribute of an identity, right? How do I actually know that student was legitimately in the classroom today, or that that student is that student? I don't know, right? Um, so these are all really cool things that will come about as this science evolves. Um, all right, some really unique, specific examples. Talk about it, a song as a business. Like, why can't a song be a smart contract? 
and it has its own governance and its own rules. It costs X amount of tokens per second streamed. This isn't, that, that's not possible today. This is why you have all sorts of different, you know, licensing and royalty issues. This is why Pan, uh, not Pandora, but Spotify just bought, you know, a blockchain company. They, the writing's on the wall. This is where it's going. If I'm cr the creator of these smart contracts, then, then I can monetize on a transactional basis as people for the usage of my smart contract, right? Um, autonomous vehicles incorporated on the blockchain. You've heard Elon Musk's vision, right? He's basically, if you buy a Tesla, uh, it's going to be on the Tesla ride sharing network. And when you're at home sleeping at night, it's going to be off in you know, Los Angeles somewhere, driving people around, going clubbing all night long. That's the vision. How do you manage those rights to that thing? That's, and how do you distribute profits and help you know, ensure that the profits are collected properly, gas is paid for, um, you know, those profits go towards you know, my lease fee, whatever. Blockchain's a great technological framework to do that at scale. Imagine if you had to do paper documentation, which is the way we would do it today. As a lawyer, and I have to write an actual paper. Yeah, we can do it in Microsoft Word, but it, it's it's still at the end of the day, it's this kind of old school way of doing things. Um, imagine the idea of IPOing a physical thing like a Picasso. Right? You could create a token-based system. And now I can fractionalize the ownership of a Picasso, so I can own 0.0045 of a Picasso, right? And I can then turn around, I can trade that ownership with other people in a, in a, in a marketplace, or maybe that acquisition of that token actually has voting rights associated with it. And we can all vote where that Picasso sits. And so you, like, that's now possible. It, it, it was possible before in the old ways, but it's the cost, the transaction cost of doing that was too high. Now you've dramatically lowered the transaction cost of doing that through technological framework. Turning a virtual good into a unique digital asset. If there's gamers in the room and you play the massive multiplayer online games, you're running around World of Warcraft, and you want that sword, how do I know, A, that that sword is that sword? How am I sure that that is the, that is the unique sword in that digital world? And then what if I want to go in with a bunch of my buddies and buy that sword together and then trade it and have governance around it? You can now do that stuff. It's, it, you know not entirely possible today. I mean, it, again, some of these things are possible, but the transaction costs of doing them are high. <clears throat> New marketplaces, we kind of talked about. Well, I could swap a piece of my sword with a piece of Picasso on an exchange. You know, you're, you think about the world of finance as alternative investments as opportunities, and they're already kind of looking for these different things. This is a gateway to that stuff. Um, we have distributed autonomous corporations on here, but for what's relevant to you guys is, <clears throat> you know, if, it, if you think about your transcripts, that's like one really good use case, I think, in terms of education that we've talked a little bit about. So people are working on that. A lot of people are working on it. So like, you could certify your transcripts digitally. MIT is working on doing it for their mm -hmm. own current um, certification, but then there's like another group called um, it's the Sony Global Exchange, where they're trying to create a more uh, global way to certify and access transcripts securely for, for people. So it's actually a marketplace there instead of people digging out some old transcript and trying to prove it is what it is. So there, I mean, there's, that's definitely, in terms of education, one area people are focused on. Um, but and how many people try to falsify transcripts today? I mean, I don't actually know the numbers on that, but I imagine it happens. And maybe less so at the K-12 level, but... Sure, but definitely at the university level. No, okay, saying no. no. <laughs> well, you know, how do you know? And how do you, 
You're, these, are, these are just things you don't know. But also then when you think about the future of education, you start saying, all right, we have MOOCs and we have, you know, more project-based learning and different ways people are assessing learning. And it's not just all diploma-based. You know, how do you start to certify each of those little modules and tack them together into something that you can prove is, you know, is an education? Mm -hmm. um, that's, as those things turn digital, you know, the verification of those things should turn digital as well. Mm -hmm. So I think those are those are cool things. Again, at the crux of a lot of these, Bettina and I talk a lot about it, is the problem with identity, right? And That's that not a blockchain a problem. problem. <laughs> not a blockchain problem. That is a global problem. It may not be a blockchain problem. Do you see if the blockchain could help fix that problem? It can help, yeah. So, so at the same time, do you see that as a complete loss of privacy? It's a really good question. I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. Yeah, it's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people feel that yeah, way. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think it's a, if anything, there's a lot of really cool things happening. So first of all, just your ownership of Bitcoin, they don't, they don't know who actually owns that Bitcoin. They see a signature and an account, but the person behind that account is, is basically anonymous. So that's a really great affordance of it. Uh, and a lot of, this is why people don't put data onto a blockchain. It's often some sort of encrypted storage elsewhere. But you're pointing to the context and the keys. Like, you provide me with your key or to the app. Okay, now I'm going to grant you access to that data. And that I've used the blockchain as sort of a yellow pages to point to, the, point to where that is. Right, I guess I just, I, I would worry about, okay, say like voting online, right? Okay, mm -hmm. great. Verify your identity. Yeah. However, someone attaches additional metadata to that blockchain signature that verifies it's me, right? And so then all of a sudden it's this weird exposure that was unintentional. Because yeah. It's, it's, we talk, yeah, it's this outside is. Outside of the context yeah. of what the blockchain was originally sure. created for. Sure. Yeah. Right? yeah, I think there's tons of questions about privacy on that. There's also like, there's two points I would make. One is the technology is evolving, right? We're yeah. seeing even cryptographically things like zero knowledge proofs happen, which is basically like I can prove to you data without showing you data. I can prove statements are true without ever revealing the data. So you get these like little black boxes of being able to verify things without actually ever seeing them. So I don't even have to know it's you. I just have to know somebody who is verified is asking me for X data and I can prove I have it. That's basically Zcash. It's kind of what Zcash is up to, yeah. So, um, so there's like, part of it is the science will evolve and we'll actually be able to do a lot more of this stuff with a lot less sensitive information. And there's the, there's the other side of it, which is think about what you have today. How many times do you enter all of your personal identifiable information? How much metadata lives out in the world about you as an individual, yeah. right? Shit talk. I mean, it's just, it's yeah, you're already massively how much overexposed. Data brokers, <laughs> you know, yeah. paid to just move your information, yeah. and yeah. you know that's not secure at all. Yeah. So there's sort of the what do we have today? Yes, we need standards. We need to think about the privacy elements, especially as you know governments get involved, etc. You know, there's a lot of concerns around that, but it's also like what do, do we weigh it against what we have, and where is the technology headed that could potentially solve some of the concern there? One more short question. Well, it may not be short. It may be expensive. I'm curious what the implications and the future generations might look like in this type of an internet with the, the efforts of Zero Imagine and, and the conservatives that want to take control of the internet as we know it. You mean sort of the encryption debate and things like that? or? Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. yeah trying to back over to the Regulars, regulators play a super important role. Yeah, they really do. I, I, these are things to, this is, this is why most people aren't building this technology in the United States, frankly. They're, they're overseas. Yeah, it's a problem. So the implication is potentially we continue down the path and the rest gets left out of the conversation. 
we are already getting left out of the conversation, I think, in many ways. I yeah. think, yeah, we're not as far ahead as other countries yeah. are on blockchain in particular. But I would also say, it's kind of Pandora's box. You're not going to stick it back in there. It's not going to go away. And so, mm. or you know, organizations and the governments that don't learn and adapt to systems that, that are beneficial for the public, you know, people will use it anyway. And they do mm. already. So yeah. it's, I, don't, I don't really think it's going away. I think it's a question of, there's kind of a race going on right now across different jurisdictions of like, who's blockchain friendly? Where are we going to see the next blockchain financial hub emerge? Yeah. You know, um, there's definitely a lot of thought around, and, and governments think this is also going to solve a lot of their problems, to be honest. You know, everything from, you know, kind of scary ideas of they directly tax you through a blockchain system to, um, you know, because there's just that much transparency. Oh, that's right. To, <laughs> to things like, we don't want to hold your data. We know our systems are insecure as a government. We really don't want to be leaked and have all of these issues over and over again. We know there's data breaches. We'd rather put you in control of that data and we're the mm -hmm. verifiers. I mean, there's a whole spectrum, right? So it, it's important and it's going to change. And I think, you know, there's just certain countries that are really tr trying to get ahead and others aren't. I would say the U.S. is not. All right, we've got to cut off and we've got to put the rooms up and everything else. Also, feel free to email us. Right. Yeah, Honestly, you can email us for sure. Get in touch. We'll push that back out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>